Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, John Carroll. For today, we're going to go into big data and storytelling. So I remember once hearing a conversation or maybe reading about it online where someone was complaining the usual complaint about Hollywood movies, how they're sort of lowbrow and predictable, but frustratingly popular compared to more intellectual fare. And someone else uh, gave the counter argument saying, that's because Hollywood does what Aristotle told storytellers to do 2,500 years ago, to have a structure, a three-act structure, denouement, conflict, the whole bit. And there's something to that. You know, on the one hand, there's plenty of different kinds of stories. They don't all follow the Hollywood three-act structure. On the other hand, it can, meanwhile, I should say, it can be a little bit predictable, but it nevertheless works. You know, there's something about that kind of story that hooks us, that carries us along. And there are other stories that carry us along in different ways, and other people are fans of those. So given this feeling that stories, which are these quintessentially human artifacts, right, given this idea that they have structure somewhere, wouldn't it be great to do science to that idea, to try to tease out using data, using some kind of collection of information, whether or not real world stories, the stories that we like to listen to and the stories that we tell both spontaneously and from great planning, have different kinds of structure of this form. So that's what today's guest does. Peter Dodds is a statistician at the University of Vermont who studies big data kinds of problems in many different contexts, from earth sciences to language to ecology. But he's one of the heads of what is called the Computational Story Lab. And what they do is they consider individual words and they rank them. They rank these different words, or they have people rank them, in all sorts of different ways, right? Different valences for, are the words happy or sad? Are they strong or weak, etc.? And then they ask, how important are these different rankings? How much correlation is there between different kinds of axes upon which different words have these values? And they try to seek out, using math, what are the most important aspects that words can have playing a role in a story. It turns out there's a two-dimensional framework, which is very nice. Uh, Words go from a spectrum of weak to powerful and also from safe to dangerous. Those are the two aspects, those are the two axes that matter the most for the impact that words have in stories. And then you can plot real stories, whether it's novels or screenplays. For that matter, you can plot things like the state of the, uh, the emotional state of the world by looking at Twitter or looking at other social media. I'm not gonna give away all of the answers here, but Peter does a good job of explaining how stories do have structure. It's not just our imagination. We're not just imprinting structure on it from inside ourselves. There's a real sense in which successful stories have a certain kind of flow. And it's fascinating to look at why people respond to the stories in different ways, which you can look at on Twitter, right? What kinds of events are causing people to be happy or sad, to take refuge in words that are powerful or dangerous or weak or safe or whatever? So this is very early days, I think, for this kind of work. It's very difficult. Language, humanity, meaning, it's all there. But we're beginning to have these big data sets that let us ask these questions in really new ways. So it's going to be exciting to see what comes out of this kind of work. So let's go. Peter Dodds, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Uh, thanks. It's uh, great to be here. I think a good starting point for this, because uh, as we just said seconds ago, before we started recording, uh, there's a lot to cover. Uh, but I love your invocation of the famous Kurt Vonnegut uh, lecture about the shapes of stories. And in some sense, you're taking that idea, the shapes of stories, and quantifying it, you know, like being a good scientist, using the big data techniques to uh, nail down some numbers. Is that more or less an accurate, uh, it's a partial thing that you do, of course, but is that an accurate way of saying one of the things that you're aiming to do? Yeah, I I mean, I have this kind of layout for basic science and there are sort of two pieces, fundamental pieces, which are describe and explain, just to sort of make it really simple. And I I do that because I think it helps students understand which part they're acting on. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but Coming into that is is taste, and you know wh- what do you choose to work on? What's meaningful? What what you know? And that that's hard, right? But it really oh, yeah. 
matters tremendously. Um, you know, and sometimes you, you're sort of a bit nervous for maybe years <laughs> about whether things will matter. I mean, the, the, you know, it's the game, right? So, uh, but, the, you know, that stories to me have become more and more, you know, for, sort of foremost in my mind of, of just this incredibly important aspect of of being a human and, and how cultures work and, and so on. And, and I know many different fields and just people in general easily have come to that, right? Religions, pol- politics, you know, politics, it's all there. Uh, I came to it from social contagion, trying to think about how things spread. And, and that was all very sort of simplistic models. You know, do you sort of, you know, wear Ugg boots or not wear Ugg boots or do you wear a funny hat or not a funny hat or perhaps, you know, take on a political belief or not. But it was all, all sort of physics-y sort of mm. models, simple things. And they tell important stories about systems. And sort of out of that, eventually, over many years, started to sort of think more and more about the deeper things that people might run around with, which are, which are stories, you know. And, and, and they can range from very simple, like proverb-type stories. Um, the U.S. has rags to riches, right? The American dream is a really fundamental kind of story. Uh, and trying to, you know, so how do you then start to measure those things? How do you, right? And I'm really... I do come from a physics background. I, good. I, and I, I'm, <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> good and bad. Here right? it's good, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, stat mech kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, just if you look back through physics through thousands of years, you know, we had some pretty crazy ideas about how things worked, right? And that's, that's how science has to progress. But measurement just drove everything mm-hmm eventually right if you think about I, one of my examples that i often put out is temperature you know measuring temperature which we take for granted now but that that took well in the last 500 years hundreds of years to get to a point where people are like oh actually you can do that we we're pretty happy with measuring distance you know measuring time really hard yeah really hard, hard to right. measure time well yeah i mean amazing right it was sundials for a long long time uh and and, what, you know, and, and time is a big piece in, in some of the work we've done recently, too, like how you experience it. But so, um, all right, that's a bit bit long. But the, I, I guess with the big data kind of revolution, and we call it big data because it's about people. I mean, we've had big data in many fields, uh, is, you know, there's this kind of blue collar kind of honest hard work that we have to go back to, which is just let's really, really look at this stuff and measure it and quantify it. And um, and. and you know, maybe we had a pretty good time into the 80s and 90s of making simple models and telling all these, you know, beautiful stories about the world. But they were, um, you know, gloriously free of data, which, um, you know, that if you have a beautiful idea, they probably <laughs> don't go and look at reality, right? Because you might, you might be sad. That's in the way. Um, yeah. So, you know, and of course, string theory, right, is, you know, we've got, we've got some beautiful examples in, in physics still. Um, so, Although that's beautifully done because you can't really ever <laughs> sort it out. Uh, so, so that I feel it's just almost just being responsible, right? We're just trying to measure things well, right? We've got these hard problems. Let's let's see what we can do. And, and things have changed tremendously in the last ten to twenty years. All right. So Vonnegut, Vonnegut. You know, I, I think I came across this YouTube video of Vonnegut talking about it. It's probably how I came across it first, and I showed it to my students. I'm like, this, look, we should be able to do this. This is this fits in with work that we've been doing for many years before, which was measuring emotional states of, of populations. And, um, some people, and, some people in the audience might not actually be familiar with the video. So maybe remind us what Vonnegut's actually saying there. Yeah. So, so it's, there's sort of a five minute version. Fine. I think, I, cause I think he, he you know, told the story in, in many places. It's, it's, it's really quite charming. And, uh, so he just, he, he sort of lines up a, a graph and it's, uh, Sort of ill fortune, good fortune on the on the vertical axis, uh, you know, good fortune to the top, and then time, right? So time is the the big sort of going to the to the right there, and and then marks out a simple graph, and it's uh, it just sort of starts high and then goes down and then comes back up again like a little wave, right? And then says this is what he called a man in a hole story, right? So this is a, this is a, a, a you know, many sitcoms, many stories kind of just work like this. They start off, things go wrong, they get back to where they were. Uh, and, and and his little sort of line there was, you know, people love that story. Mm. They love it, right? It's There's nothing about plot in here, and I want to be really clear about this. This is just the overall emotional arc. It gets a bit conflated with plots, and that's that's a much deeper, harder thing that we're trying to work on as well. Like, so emotional arc. So you think, all right, well, maybe we can maybe we can do this. And uh, the the work that we had sitting around uh, that we built for a long time was this idea of 
what we call a hedonometer, right? So measuring happiness, but equally sadness, I should point out. Uh, and, and that came out of older work from the maybe 60, 70 years now, I think, of uh, trying to measure the fundamental dimensions of meaning. And this to me is really, really, I mean, this is, I, I actually, you know, this is the most exciting thing I've ever worked on, the more recent stuff about uh-huh. that, and, and we'll get to it. Yeah, I mean, just thrillingly incredible. Uh, but the the idea is, okay, well, let's, let's, if I can kind of expand on this, like, let's Please. give, yeah, give people, um, you know, so trees, cars, you know, your life, like what, what we have all these aspects of meaning associated with them, how you feel about something and, and feeling and meaning are, are allied in interesting ways. So how do you sort of boil that down, right? So we, we, we have, you know, maybe a, you could look at a dictionary of the source and you've got this rich space of meaning and, and the recent, more recent work that we have in deep learning and, and so on is like, here are 300 dimensions of meaning. And it's like, <laughs> whoa, you know, what, what could go wrong with, with that? So we're at the absolute other end of that, uh, which is what's the absolutely most essential aspect of meaning. And what was sort of, sort of dug out of um, over decades and through, you know, of course, initially small scale studies with people, obviously, stu- you know, students in, in psychology, right? It's the usual game. Uh, but here was the idea. Okay, we'll give you a bunch of objects or concepts or whatever, and you have to just um, assess them on semantic differentials, and we'll give you a bunch of these. And so they are things like hard to soft, good to bad, big to small, like all these kind of very natural things that we're, we're fairly comfortable with them being um, antonyms, right? That they, they represent opposite ends of some um, spectrum. And so we, so this was done, as I said, in the 40s and 50s. And, and the first big work was actually for pings from submarines, which is huh? quite charming. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a really <laughs> interesting work. And it's, so handlers, of, you know, sub, um, people working with radar, how did they feel about the sounds? Like, did it kind of, Danger, energy. What you know? What what did it mean to them? So uh, that that kind of spread out from there into thinking about meaning of anything. And what was sort of boiled down over many years was this idea of valence being dominant. And it's a it's a nicely inscrutable word. It's, it, it just <laughs> but it does generally. And I think that's not unuseful. But it means good to bad, basically, right? right. So happy to sad. Um, and, and so collapsing a lot of things. And so you can imagine from a evolutionary point of view, like a, a sort of a survival point of view, you know, you're an organism, you have a sense of what's good and helpful and positive and negative, and you, you know, you're attracted to uh, you know, one end and, and you're repelled from the other. So it had this very sort of fundamental aspect to it. There are a couple of dimensions that came out. And the tricky thing is you've started with hard and soft, you know, light and heavy. You've started with all these very sensible ones, and you have to figure out then because what's really going on, you were solving like an SVD type, type problem, a linear algebra problem. You have to explain like what SVD common... means. <clears throat> yeah. So singular value <laughs> decomposition. It's a, uh, what, what you're trying to figure out is if you've got all of these axes, like these semantic differentials, if we sort of take the right point of view, it may be that there's some way of adding them up and subtracting some from the others to get a really fundamental kind of dimension. Like you might see that this shape in front of you. So words have points in this space, right? There's the, you can imagine words or things, but well, let's, let's talk about words. So I'm going to present you with a word, you know, football or chicken, and you have to rate it on all of these different semantic differentials. So then it has some point in, these words have a point in the space of semantic differentials. And then the idea is we'll rotate that space around and, and play with it a little bit. And maybe we see, oh, it's kind of, you know, really dominant in these ways and say that this valence dimension is you know, it's a sum of all of these things in some complicated way but maybe you know the good bad semantic differential probably lines up with it so you're taking all these words and you have many different possible axes along mm-hmm. which your your students i guess right. or, or or subjects are rating yeah. them but some just correlate exactly with others and sort of that's kind of redundant information and you're looking for what, what are the what are the ways, what are the axes, if you like, that matter the most? Is that a fair way of saying it? That's right. That's right. And they're not, you know, it isn't any one of those semantic differentials that you started with necessarily. It's some, it's some way you have to, you have to go through that and figure out, yeah. okay, that these ones are kind of, it's, you know, it's not like um, 
mass and length and those sorts of things, right? Now we're dealing with categorical. It's it's it, so it takes a you, know, you have to sit down as a human, I think, and really kind of think through this. Uh, so so that's right, and and the work that we did initially to get this hedonometer stuff to work was to, I mean, essentially, actually, many years ago, I'm trying to figure out, okay, we've got all this data coming through, like blogs. It was a little bit before Twitter and Facebook really took off. Um, but we looked at some other things like uh, State of the Union speeches. Mm-hmm. You know, there's hundreds of years there. Uh, music lyrics for which we had you know, 60, 70 years. So we were trying to get hold of different kinds of text. So text is data that represented some aspect of human behavior. You know, none of these things are you know, complete. Of course, we wouldn't want to say that. But we thought, well, we've got this stream of, say, you know, words coming through in real time. Can we, can we figure out, like, uh, is, is this population that's expressing it happy or sad? Or, you know, are they fearful or less fearful? And partly inspired by some of the things were, that were coming out of economists around that time. Greenspan, 2007 and eight, said, you know, he would throw out all of these mathematical models if he could figure out why people are becoming more <laughs> euphoric or fearful. Yeah. It, it, it's a, I, people could probably find that interview. It's on the John Stewart. It's on, it's on the Daily Show from a long time ago. And it's, a, it's quite a remarkable. It's before the housing crash, too. Yeah. So, you know, I would carry that around as a good example. Like, well, you know, that seems a, a, a really basic thing to know. And, and of course, we want to put it up against something like GDP. You know, sure. The stock market's up, but are people happier or sadder? You know, if we, and and it goes back to measurement. If you want to improve things, where I think we're in this kind of really difficult time, where we can measure some big complicated things quite well, especially money, mm. or at least we think we can, and but we're leaving out these other mushier, harder right. pieces to measure, and as a result, of course, you try to maximize or optimize something that's and you're not measuring everything. I, I mean, I think people understand that, but you sort of also forget it. You know, you look at the <laughs> things that have charts, like. They, look, yeah. here's, here's the stock market. You look under you the lamppost, yeah. Yeah. So so that was part of our challenge. I mean, I think it was a fundamental thing about people we were trying to measure as populations. And we're not really trying to, we're not trying to track individuals. It's nothing that we would say, oh, you said this sentence, you're happy or sad. It has to be from many, many, you know, many, many words. Right. So it's more like a, a physics issue kind of that you're averaging over lots of pieces. So it kind of has an inbuilt privacy thing, um, if you like. We eventually created something online, which is at hedonometer.org, and it, it, it takes Twitter data. And that, that, that's sort of the banner thing is Twitter. And you can see over many years now, 13, 14 years, this sort of long arc of, of what you know, Twitter is a complicated thing. People have changed who, you know, who's actually active on it. I think we have 10 languages, Russian, Korean. It's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. But it, it's exactly this kind of index, if you like, What's the you know the Dow Jones index of, of happiness, uh, and it has some big uh, patterns. It's it's been going down actually for five or six years, but more recently has been kind of going up. Sorry, That's, the happiness has been going down. Yeah, for a long yeah <laughs> since about two thousand fifteen. Huh, yeah, weird. Yeah, going down, <laughs> and uh, but the last uh, last year it's been sort of slowly going up. Two thousand and twenty was the first time we saw anything that I would call collective trauma, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, I, of course, there's your own personal view of things, and, and that's what we're trying to take out of this, like what we think about things. We're trying to get a sense of a population. And, and you know, your listeners will have all of their own specific kind of feelings of, of how things have, you know, maybe 2014 was the worst year, you sure. know, personally, right? But we're trying to get out the whole picture. And, and by collective trauma, what I mean is uh, the advent of, you know, the world kind of understanding there was a pandemic. Um, we, we sort of knew in January 2020 that there were dangerous things afoot, but it wasn't really till I think it's March 12th when you know the NBA suspended its season. Yep. Tom Hanks said he had COVID. There's, there's, all these things happened in about 10 minutes. And um, uh, President Trump at the time gave a speech sort of saying for the first time that things weren't great. And so, and, and the stock market, of course, the stock market started to tank straight away. Um, so, so that... That was a big drop, and it also did what we'd seen in the past is there were these big drops for deaths of celebrities, um, terrorist attacks, school shootings, you know, these things that occupy us. But then they've, they've really quickly been wiped out by stories. You know, like the, people still talked about those things, but the, there's just this flood of stories all the time that, that, you know, of everything that's happening in the world. 
So there'd be drops, but they'd kind of come straight back up, maybe a couple of days. But it took on the order of months, really, for Twitter to sort of rebound back up to its kind of normal level at the time, which is pretty low. And then George Floyd's murder was a huge drop, but it kept dropping as the protest built mm. over the next few days because of people understanding what had happened and being out, you know, uh, expressing their, um, you know, the, their, their feelings online or what we measured as feelings. And that was the, that's the lowest drop we've ever seen. And again, it took this lo- a long time to come out of. January 6th was another big drop, actually. That's probably the third lowest over the whole time. So this was, you know, that's a whole, there's, there are many things have kind of uh, come out of all of that where we can measure happiness of texts in lots of ways. And to finally get back to Vonnegut, what we did was we went to books and we said, all right, let's see what he could, this is this idea of Vonnegut's. And he actually, you know, he says, this is so simple, even computers could do it. You know, this is maybe 1990, 95 when he was saying these things. And we thought, all right, we can probably do it. And <laughs> uh, so, so, <laughs> so, and, and in fact, it turns out that I think in maybe, when was it, 60s or 70s, he had, he had, I think it was the University of Chicago. He wanted to do this as a master's thesis. Right, right. He right. had presented it and, and they said no. And he was still mad about that for decades and decades <laughs> and decades. You can find him, you know, talking about how that, how upsetting that was to him. Uh, so, so it's sort of a, an homage to him in some ways. But uh, we, we, you know, we got a bunch of books. Maybe I think twenty thousand. Um, you have to sort out what's fiction. It's a bit of a mess. Uh, but basically, created this same hedonometer idea. But in this case, you're now sliding through the book. So you're going to say, okay, a thousand. The first thousand words have this score, and then we'll slide this little window. Okay. And we're not reading it like a person, right? We're we're just it's like sometimes called a bag of words method. You're just going to whoop, put them all together and, and slide and, and get a score for them, right? So not all words we have scores for, right? And, and some words we, you know, say that the, the score is, is um, unimportant. Like the word the is a neutral word. You know, we ask people what they think of that word, right? So we, as I said, we had psycho- people do with psychology students, of course, early on. You know, eventually it's online. You do it with Mechanical Turk, mm-hmm. which is an Amazon service where you, you, know, you ask people what, what they think about things. Um, or you can use it to do all sorts of things. But uh, so, so the, you know, the, the scale of these studies is now really quite large. So, you, you anyway, sort so of we have s- you know, scores for words. Yeah, so you sort of separately score the individual words, and yes. now you're you're taking novels or what have you, works of fiction, and mm-hmm. uh, scoring, as you say, sections of those as as you go through the text, and so you can see the happiness or the sadness go up and down as you read through the text. Right, and you play around with the window size, and you think about this. And yeah. we did it for movie scripts as well. Scripts are useful; they have descriptions of what's going on, so it's you know they're actually somewhat rich. Um, you can't get the final one, which I realized um, <laughs> as we were doing this, because I right. was looking at Alien, mm-hmm. and I was looking through the script, and Ripley is a man um, in the what it might be the fourth, the last script of you know, version of that. Anyway, so you've got some version of it, and um, and you you do what you can. So uh, you know, if you look at something like Predator, it starts okay, and then just goes to like it's terrible. You know, like it's just <laughs> negative and drops. There's no there's no sort of you know, ups and downs, and which we're more familiar with with stories like so. You know, Harry Potter, the last, uh, the was it the Deathly Hallows, the the last book. You know, really huge ups and downs mm. as it goes through, right? So, and, and you know, I think that's we we sort of think we're we're trying to figure out what's is there sort of characteristic scales of right of of, of fiction. Uh, so, but what came out of that, and and we attacked it in various ways, but there are sort of six fundamental shapes if you like and and there was uh a rags to riches one so very simple basically sort of goes up throughout the book you know may have some up and ups and downs but that's sort of a you know this is like kind of like decomposing something into you're decomposing a sound you know in, in, into its Fourier waves or whatever yeah you like. it's a bit like that and i, I want to add something that's much more complicated though so but this is this is of course we're looking at emotional arc so we do have signals there's the um, tragedy, where things just keep going down. So metamorphosis, maybe Kafka, right? It starts off. It starts off badly. You're a cockroach to start with, and then it keeps going down. Uh, and then there's the man in the hole type one of Vonnegut. There's the op- the inverse of that, which we called Icarus, right? So it starts. Things go really well, and then they go really bad. 
Uh, and then we had two others, which were Cinderella and Oedipus, right? So Cinderella starts low, goes high, you know, you've gone to the ball, this fairy godmother's turned up and then things go badly again. And then, then you know, it, so there's a huge rise. And that's one of Vonnegut's fam- you know, favorite little mm. stories that, that he talks about Cinderella fitting this pattern. So it's a simple, you know, down, up, down, up. And the flip of that we had, we called that Oedipus, right? Starts well, things go bad. Then you kill your father and marry your mother. You know, like it ends, it ends, it ends, it ends poorly. It ends poorly. Um, so, I mean, yeah, just to, because sadly we don't have the visuals here for the audience, but yeah, this I'm is, to, as yeah. I was, I, I saw your plots though. The visuals are great. And, uh, plots in the sense of graphs, not plots in the sense of story structures, but, uh, right. it is, a, it's, I mean, what, what fraction of stories fit into these? Cause it's a very simple kind of ex post facto natural thing. There's, there's sort of the, the stories right. that have no maxima or minima in the revolution, right? It's either rights or riches or tragedy. And then there's stories mm. with one maximum or minimum and there's stories with two maxima or minima in, in that basic arc. Is that like, are those six possibilities, uh, how, what fraction of stories covered by that? I mean, it's some, you know, it's, it's again, one of these things where it's like 90, 95%. It's amazing. Of, yeah. Of, but of, of this particular pool of books, right. So, you know, and this set of works. So I think the future of this, of course, is to curate things really well. Like here are, here are detective stories, here are stories from this particular culture and so on. So, so it becomes a, mm. it, and we found this with uh, the hedonomy to work in general, if you estimate the happiness of a set of words, you might say, oh, okay, maybe I can get an error measure for that, right? This is a very typical thing to do with measurement. But it turns out it was completely in the lens. It's completely in the words, the list of words for which you have scores. Mm. So if you change that list of words by scoring more or taking some out, you know, that's where the error is. It's all in the instrument. So, you know, in this, in this case, yeah, we're, we're, we, we have a, it's one of these things where we seem to have a big data set. We have 20,000 books, you know, that's a hard thing to read, right? So this is, gets beyond it, right? I mean, it's important, right? It gets beyond it. It's simple. No one's going to read 50 million tweets a day, right? And so what we're trying to do is what, what I've sort of called telenomics, which is like distant measure, sensing of knowledge, right? So far, it's a genomics, uh, like far knowledge. And, and because, yeah, there's no way an individual can do that. Uh, and, right. and we want to get some sense of what you know, the, the whole thing sort of streaming, if all these tweets stream past you in three seconds. How would you feel? Pretty bad, probably. Just would, in yeah, general, because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, taking that part out, you know, was it, is it better or worse than yesterday? Uh, I want to say that the, um, the, the man and I, so the man in the whole one, which, which is this favorite one of Vonnegut. So I, I would say that the, the framing of that is, is, is not great actually, because, I mean, you know, he's sitting there, he has a drawing, so you can, like we're, we're struggling here with the podcast, but, you know, he has a drawing, so you can kind of see it in front of mm. you and it all makes sense. But Manahol doesn't tell you a sense of time. Mm. It doesn't give you a an arrow, right? So metamorphosis could be man, man in a deepening hole, as that turns out. But, you know, person in a hole, it doesn't tell you that they start okay, they get into the hole and they get out of it. And the, what, the, and I, I guess I think a lot about ads and slogans and so on, and, and it struck me before, the 2016 election that make America great again was the man in a whole arc. And it was in four words. It tells you about the, you know, it indicates something about the past, the present and the future, mm-hmm. which is, you know, really powerful. <laughs> and it's, as I understand, it's 1980. I think it's a uh, Reagan and Bush. It was used in ads and like, let's make America great again. It was used in posters and so on. It wasn't quite the dominant slogan, um, but it, it's one of those ones that's really, powerful bill clinton used it lots of people have used it over the years in various ways because it is it is very powerful i mean and and i think that you know as a rhetorical as a as a story in four words super you know super powerful and do you find that there are you alluded to this a little bit but relationships between these different kinds of story arcs or valence arcs whatever you want to call them and genre or literariness of the fiction i mean are there certain kinds of uh or do you get highbrow fiction using one kind of pattern and uh, pot boilers using another one? You know, we are working on that more now. Uh, we have some work where we're looking at things like accounting textbooks and, mm. um, you know, manuals for televisions. And, you know, just like what happened? Because you want to know, like, are, are we getting something artificial? It's certainly if you randomly shuffle text, it's, it's you know, it doesn't produce these shapes, right? There, there's 
I mean, as you might hope, right? So there's sort of a, we can at least get that um, sorted out. Uh, but again, that's a curation of data and uh, that, that, that I think we're still um, behind on. We're, we're trying to build, well, we do have this thing called Story Wrangler. It's at storywrangling.org and it's for Twitter at the moment. But the idea is to um, kind of house all of these different um, bodies of work and have a time series for their usage of words within them. So that hopefully eventually will be something that could kind of you know, go towards what you're saying. We do, of course, have Google Books, which has been around you know, f- for about 10 years now. Um, the problem with that, I think, is, is that it doesn't have enough metadata. You can't really sort out this sort of broadly fiction, okay. broadly everything. And as it turns out, we, we, we you know, did some work on it and we figured out that uh, actually the, the kind of collective English stuff is full of science. There's a lot of medical and science mm. type writing. And the 20th century is basically dominated by the sort of rise of science. And you can see it in little details like figure with a capital F. It just goes <laughs> up. And like, you know, et, et al. And, and, and all the things to do with dates are really actually about the that exponential growth of, 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 of science, which is right. sort of understood, I suppose, in the 60s to solar price um, Presumably, armed with a million graduate students, went through libraries figuring out, you know, what what the memory was in journals and and how much stuff was being published. And anyway, that's imprinted in there in a way that we can't. Undo. Well, it makes sense. I, I think I noticed uh, on your webpage that the most commonly used word on Twitter is RT, the abbreviation for yes. retweet. <laughs> so that doesn't really mean it's the yes. most commonly used in English, but on that particular medium, that's what pops out. Right, and you have to say, you know, what what do you Right. What are you looking at? Twitter is interesting because it does kind of encode so much and the news is for sure there. I mean, another way to look at all, all of this is to think about you know, forests, right? So we have a forest and you would like to know all of the species in the, in the forest, which is actually, of course, very hard to measure, um, and have the counts for them, right? How many are there mm-hmm. of all these different species? So this is this, it comes out of linguistics, but the types and tokens distinction, like how, what are the, all of the, you know, what's your... Your lexicon, which would be for language, here's your list of words, um, and then here's your list of all the animals and organisms, yeah. and then you have next to it the counts, right? But then you want to do that over time. So maybe for forests, it's at the scale of a year. Um, there are studies that do this for small parts of forests, but that's the kind. We're sort of looking at forests of words and stories and trying to see how they change over time. And of course, they they can change dramatically. I mean, let me. I don't want to lose track of um, th- this other thing that we mentioned, and then we sort of buried it in the in the happiness versus sadness discussion. But there are this. There is this multi-dimensional way of thinking about the words, uh, and you've you've done your factor analysis to try to figure out what dimensions matter the most. And uh, why don't you tell us what what those dimensions are that matter the most? Yeah, I actually just wrote that down. Um, so the. So this has been, I think, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I mean, it's still in review, so we'll see what happens. But we're, we're pretty confident about all of this. So, all right, so we had valence. And, and, this, and when we sort of saw that uh, at the time in the literature, that this, these were the domi- this is the dominant axis. And certainly when you look at the data back then, um, and I think we're looking at data sets that had a 1,000 words with scores associated with so it's not a big set of words, right? People's vocabularies are tens of thousands, you know, you know, something like Twitter with all its misspellings is hundreds of thousands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, you want something on that order. And over time, what has happened, um, of course, there have been bigger studies done and done in slightly different ways. And uh, so we've gotten, just as you might hope in science, you know, more accurate, richer um, works. Back then, 12, 13 years ago, the the main idea of what was going on was there was valence, which is this happy, sad, good, bad kind of axis. And there were a couple others, though. One was um, about dominance, like do you feel in control or not in control when you when you kind of consider something? And there was another one, was, which is activity. It's very, got various you know, names for it, but basically kind of activation. Is this exciting or boring? So there have been these other sort of secondary dimensions that people have you know, had floating around, and then sort of debates about which ones matter. Okay, so we've got this work from, we didn't do this this study, but a couple of years ago, it's worked by Mohammed in Canada. Uh, again, 
online, many, many people uh, doing these evaluations, and now we've got 20,000. Now it's 20,000 words, right? So there's a huge jump from, say, 1,000 and, and work that we did, which got to 10,000. And they're mostly good kind of words, right? They don't have people's names or events, which can be a bit of a, an issue with some of these um, large sets of words. All right, so the idea was the, the people were, were going to evaluate these on valence and what was called arousal, which is the activation one and dominance, right? So you're given mm -hmm. these three dimensions. And, and it is tricky. How do you present that to people? So you kind of have to give them kind of clouds of words at each end. Right. So they kind of know that, you know, the positive end of valence is you feel good, you feel happy, you feel maybe comforted. You know, there, it's, a, it's a bit spread out. But that's fine. Everyone's given that same, you know, uh, those same instructions. But looking harder at this stuff and then, again, doing this kind of factor analysis, um, you can see you've got this kind of, you now it's a three-dimensional space. You've, maybe the maybe it doesn't come back like in the dimensions you've actually tried to impose, that, that you've tried to say to people, uh, you know, we think these are the fundamental dimensions. That's good, but you can see like what they actually think. You know, maybe they correlated some of those. Yeah. And that actually turns out to be the case. And if you sort of rotate this football and kind of squeeze some of the axes and pull some of them apart, you get a, another shape. And it has these two main, well, we played around with it for a while, but it has these two main axes. And the one going across, if you like, horizontally is powerful, power up weak, right? So, so power over here is like for people would be success, triumph, if you, if you sort of go back to people. Um, so it's kind of winning. And then the weak end of that is void and nothing. Mm. So it's not failure. It's, it's just emptiness. So that's going across the page. And then up uh, is pointing up, and you know, this is our choice, danger. So this is like a compass for, for basic meaning. And so danger is up and safety is down. And we call this, uh, all right, we make up words, but <laughs> Uzi, Uziometry, right? <laughs> uh, so uzi, Uzio means, you know, I mean, we're taking it to mean essence. It's a, a Greek word, uh, but it is where the word essence comes from. So O-U-S-I-A. And, and we felt... I mean, it's fun to make up words, but it was also like, it's not semantics, it's not semiotics. It's, and it, we're not measuring meaning. We're measuring, and that's somehow it's depicted. We don't want people to think that we're measuring essential meaning if you distill everything down. So we've tried this out with many different um, corpora. So things like the Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes novels and stories, short stories, um, Jane Austen's works. So they're sort of, you know, famous authors. And then a huge collection of fiction from Google with sort of complicated thing, but it's 120 years. So that's everything sort of smudged together equally. Um, Wikipedia, a snapshot of Wikipedia, which is a, you, know, you would think, a, a, a just a different object. Uh, talk radio. Mm. So that's transcriptions of talk radio. So now we're going for you know, spoken word. It's been turned into text, but that's a different, it's spontaneous. It's different. It includes everything from, you know, NPR to, sort of shock jock stuff, right? So it's a, it's a big grab bag. Um, the New York Times as well, 20 years of the New York Times. And so we look, so, so this is this type token distinction again, right? So that sort of first work where we found this danger safe axis and power weak axis was looking at types. Like every word got one vote. Yeah. And so we kind of figure it out. And that's, that's good, but it's just the substrate. And then you have to go and see what people actually you know, what in these different venues and, and beyond, how do they use these? How often do they use these? Now ones? I want to do this with do, all of my podcast episodes. I have transcripts for all of them. I want to know which ones are powerful or weak or dangerous or safe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we kept, and when I, those ones I just listed, you know, we didn't do them all at once. They were sort of like, you'd kind of like corral sure. the data and then kind of do the same analysis again. And I remember every time thinking, will this be different? What, what, you know, what's going on? They're all a little bit different, of course, but all of them have what I'll call is the safe, a safety bias, that the predominance of words that people use uh, are in this, in this lower half of this kind of this, this disc, if you like. And, and, and it's words that are trend, trend towards being safe. You know, mm. at the bottom are things like um, uh, comfort. Uh, if you want to go out to safe week, you get the words like sofa and tortoise. Um, and then, you know, safe and, and powerful are words like wisdom and happiness. They're, 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 that's a real, and that turns out that quadrant, that's what I'll call the safe, powerful um, quadrant, it sort of lines up with 
positivity and happiness. Mm -hmm. And there's this much older work um, that we built on um, when we looked at large text, which is which came up with this idea of the Pollyanna principle that in general interactions between people and so this communication of all kinds, there are more positive aspects than negative ones. It's a bit surprising to people, I think, because you know it's easy to kind of bring to mind arguments or negativity on maybe <laughs> online or the news is terrible, you know the, the, these sorts of things. But if you think you know society exists, it can not exist, but it it does exist and it does hold together from lots of little sort of positive interactions. And I, so this was work, this is maybe six or seven years ago. What well, was, so, I mean, I didn't expect this was surprising. It sort of popped out that there are more positive words than negative words. Mm. That's just, and it's true across, uh, uh, we looked at 10 major languages, 24 corpora, you know, Russian, German, Korean, Indonesia. So we, um, we, we looked at a lot of different, different pieces there and it really kept coming out. So, uh, and, and, you know, there was a sort of a story there. I mean, that, that it's language is our great social technology, mm. right? We're excited about Snapchat or something, but, you know, really language is this unbelievable thing that we have. Money is another one, I, I suppose, <laughs> perhaps, you know, because we've somehow encoded belief into this abstract thing. It's pretty Do weird. I remember correctly though, that, uh, in, Fictional stories, in particular, there's more danger than you might expect, or I mean, than you than you have in ordinary language, because obviously a story wants to be exciting somehow. Um, it's a good question. If it's more so, so all of them have, on average, a positivity bias. Okay. Now there are parts where they dip below into this negative side of things, but you know, if you look at music lyrics, one of the first things we looked at, the way and they kind of told us that we were getting somewhere. The rankings, so at the bottom is heavy metal. Right. <laughs> Wait, the bottom right? of, of I mean, what? Uh, of the graph? Yeah, well, this is sort of like ranking, like taking genre. This is something where we were, and, and you did ask about genres yeah. for, for fiction, but this is actually something where we did have genres. Um, and uh, on this, this is on the happiness one. Okay. Right? So this is, yeah. And at the top is gospel and, and soul, right? So it kind of makes it, the ordering looked pretty good for this very rudimentary in instrument we'd made. But even, you know, heavy metal, it was still above neutral on average, right? Yeah, still good to know, even though, yeah, it's just still above. So if you look at a, you know, maybe Harry Potter or something like when things go bad, they, it does dip into this, this negative thing, which is pretty hard because you've got to use a lot of negative words because on average, the bulk of words are over in the positive side of things, or at least, you know, there's a skew towards positivity. So the generalization of that now is that in fact, it's a safety bias that we're not just it's not really positive it's it's that we're using more safer words yeah, and okay. dangerous words you know they're incredibly important they describe all of these things that can go wrong we just don't use them as much and when we use them of course they're incredibly meaningful but so so happiness is is basically yes is is safety plus power and and one of the things the other thing that i thought was really fascinating was different stories that you looked at have char you can associate characters mm -hmm. in the narrative with you know along this dangerous versus safe and powerful versus weak axis and i guess harry potter had like all sorts of characters like you know they're dangerous mm -hmm. ones weak ones etc whereas in game of thrones almost everyone's <laughs> powerful and a lot of them are very dangerous <laughs> it, was, it was more right. like a very a right. clash of extremes in that in that way so that, that work, again, it's like completely thrilling to me. This is just incredibly exciting because this comes from a completely different data set. So this is a sort of an online thing. Again, not something we did, but it, but it went back to giving people characters from stories. And it, 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 there are a lot of TV shows and movies, but there's also Pride and Prejudice, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some, some books are in there. Um, and zooming out and presenting, it's about 100... It might be 200, but 150 of these semantic differentials. So sort of going way back in time in a way and giving people, you know, the, but for, so it's for characters. So this country, city, you know, that the, the kind of rich, poor, there are things that may be a little more, you know, clearly assigned to people. Uh, so so we were able to sort of start again with a, a really rich set of semantic differential. And I think there are about 800 characters that we looked at over 90 different I'll call them story verses, right? There's Buffy the Vampire Slayer, mm -hmm. there's X-Files, <laughs> you said Game of Thrones. It's a, it's a Arrested Development is in there. It's, a, it's really a, yeah. a, a big spread. So I think there's something for everyone, right? You might not know 
eighty percent of them, but there, there'll be some that you could look at. So, uh, so, so this is a completely different data set. And doing this analysis again, and you know, turning things around and kind of rotating spaces, and, and not really doing anything funny. Where we're, we're saying we're desperate to find this power danger thing. It really popped out for free. Mm. So this is something that's just you know very sort of supportive of what we've done in this other space. And there is a third dimension, and I should mention that one, because it's, in general, it's about what we call structure. So structured to unstructured. So a rock, you know, has, has a stronger structure level, um, cardinal, bureaucracy, boss, right? These are, these are considered more structured, but clown and conical and tickle, th- th- these, are, these are words that go out, confetti, they're considered unstructured. And so for characters, it's playfulness. Mm. It's much more about playfulness. So someone like, you know, Robin Hood, right, is, 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 has a playful measure on them. Or Mulder from the X-Files is, is playful. Scully is not playful. Um, not a lot of playfulness in Game of Thrones. Pretty much all of them are in the, da- <laughs> pretty much all of them are in the dangerous powerful quadrant, right. which is the dominant. You know, these are the, this is like dangerous winning, Basically, mm. you know, things can go wrong for you, uh, except for um, I'm going to get his name. Oh, uh, Samuel Tarly, if you know yeah. that. Tarly, yes. So he's he's in he's down in the kind of the the angel character. So Jane Bennett is there from Pride and Prejudice. These are people who are, um, you know, they they they're they're more towards the safe um, right. axes. They're still in somewhat powerful, but they're more in the safe. So these are just really really good people. That's who you find down the bottom. Um, if you go around safe into the kind of weak quadrant, then you get people who tend to, you know, they're not bad people, but they tend to get run over. Um, and again, and out, and out in the weak side, you get Mike, you know, Michael Scott from The Office, Homer Simpson is out there. <laughs> you know, and, and then I wanted to say that if you go further up, you get, and this is where Joffrey is from Game of Thrones. There aren't many from Game of Thrones in this. What's, what's the dangerous weak quadrant? Yeah, okay. And that's the ch- chaos agents. Uh, they're the chaos agents. And uh, again, I, I guess this might be future research, but you have this time series of, you know, of how the valence of the story itself evolves page by page. And, th- yeah. and now you're saying there's a, there's a different set of analysis with sort of the, the distribution of characters uh, or distribution of whatever events and, and so forth. Um, and how, if you just gave me that, like if you didn't tell me the plot, right, or the characters or the setting or whatever, how much could I learn? How much could I infer about the story just by thinking about, you know, both how it evolved over time and what kinds of characters it involved? Do we know that yet? I, I mean, we, we are really trying to do that. And and I think it, it's remarkable. So I sort of think of character as the shortcut to story, right? Mm-hmm. So. We, we as what what, a, you know, what do we do with stories, right? A lot of them are about prediction. They're about telling us how the world works. Um, proverbs do this. Stories that we listen to, like these are ways that your life can go, or maybe other people's lives can. We're trying to make sense of the world, and and there are certain, yeah, you know, we 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 tend to have stories wrapped around individuals, which I think is interesting, you know, because we want to be in them. So it's hard for us to tell stories about systems, and that's why. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to complex systems and all these sort of phenomena that scientists work on, <laughs> it's really hard, right? Because people want to anthropomorphize everything. Right. They absolutely do, and I understand. You know, I understand that drive, but it's, 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 it's hard. It's it's hard for us to tell those stories. So, but I think one of the things. So, you know, stories are incredibly important. That's sort of what I'm trying to say there. But we we also can shortcut them by. Just saying, oh, here are, here are what these characters are like. Here are archetypes. And, and we sort of know what will happen if you say here are these three people and here are their we, – we can kind of try to predict what will happen between mm-hmm. them. Um, so I think they're like little kind of wind-up toys, right? So, you, you know, in our brains, we will try to simulate. We'll run the dynamical system of these characters interacting. Um, it, it's, it's very natural. We want to do it. We want to predict, um, and, you know, to a fault, obviously. Uh, so – what we're trying to do now with this is, this is tough, but you want to uh, get the this sort of danger power profile around a character and how it might evolve through a story as well. Uh, there's the temporal network of which characters are interacting with each other. We right. should be able to get that out. Uh, and with the environments, right? And you, know, um, there are, you could imagine doing this for 
you know, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or something like that, or, you know, Pride and Prejudice, any, any of these pieces. So what can, can we kind of trace that through? And it might be pretty rough, you know, we divide books into thirds or something, but then we could, you know, do 100,000 stories and, and get out what are the big patterns. Uh, breaking in and you know, seeing, seeing this kind of this two-dimensional space has been, you know, very helpful mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. I mean, I think it's really what it is. Another sp- space we've looked at, perhaps just to start with, is, is Twitter, because we've yeah. worked on that a lot. But looking at um, at least what was expressed on Twitter for the January 6th, right, the, the, the attack on the Capitol, what you see there is, you know, just taking all the tweets and, and scoring them is, you know, measures, it's sort of these pre- these measures of energy, like high energy that I sort of mentioned before, and um, happiness kind of goes down. But really what you see on this kind of compass of essential meaning is that it really points straight to danger. It actually goes straight to danger, right? So, sorry, upwards, danger, um, which is, you know, danger is kind of high energy plus badness in a way is okay. sort of the, to, to, to yeah. use these kind of all, uh, other frameworks. Um, and it, so, so in that respect, you'd see it, you know, it goes down as being a sad thing on our hedonometer, but that's just a projection onto that axis, right? It's a shadow of the real direction, which was pure danger. That's very interesting, especially because one of the questions I was going to ask was, um, if, if you're looking at happiness versus sadness on Twitter, that's an obviously a very interesting thing. But when I actually looked at the data, you know, everyone's happy on holidays. That that that's a clear winner, uh-huh. right? Christmas, uh, mm-hmm. or at least you put out your happy tweets on Christmas, and then everyone's Correct. sad when there's a terrorist attack or a shooting. Okay, uh, but other events like a presidential election um, are are more of a mixed bag, and I'm wondering if there are. Uh, the simplest possible thing I can think of is just a measure of the variance, right? Like, is it something where a whole bunch of people are happy and a whole bunch of people are sad at an election result? Or is that something that you've quantified? Yeah, we have it. We just haven't put it on the site. Um, I, and I think that's, you know, you're exactly right. So how much, uh, you know, to what degree are people in unison about something? Mm. Um, and, and for the extreme things, just in some ways they have to be, right? Just for those scores to be so high right. and so low. Uh but you no, know, so you're quite right. So there, there is a predictability to the big spikes in positivity, and there, there are just annual holidays, right? And so people are using the, you know, the expressions of that time. You know, even Happy Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. Now, if you look at the words being used and compare them maybe to some other dates, you can see that there's really some negativity in there as well. It's being swamped <laughs> by this kind of positive, right? So, so Valentine's Day will have lonely. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, it, but it's it's being kind of wiped out, and Christmas might have that as well, or so. It's a, it, it's it's not. So you want to be a little careful there. It's just it's not like everyone is you know doing that. There are there, and you can see for days of the week. So Saturday is generally the most positive day. Tuesday is generally the most negative day. But Saturday, you know, it has movies, weddings. You know, like there's lots of positive things that might happen on Saturday, but it also has bored and hangover. You know, there mm. there are some. So not you know not all it's not all great for everyone on a Saturday. And there's a daily rhythm too, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a strong daily rhythm, which I kind of <laughs> I think it's actually in science magazine. I have this line, which is uh, it's the daily unraveling unraveling <laughs> of the human mind. <laughs> so we kind of I know sleep remains a mystery, but I, I think we need to be rebooted because I think we just become emotionally unstable uh. by the end of the day. I, you know, <laughs> that's that's I'm I'm being, being funny, but you see, swearing goes up through the day. Cursing <laughs> goes up through the day, and um, you know things. Yeah, and then uh, like you sort of say, the variance goes up as well. The emotional variance goes up through the day. So people start off fairly tight, like things are okay, but it's not emotionally varied as well, right? The the, the yeah, and then the wheels kind of come off as as the collectively. I mean, if you're if if one is being a little bit um, uh, skeptical here, is, is it possible that you know I might think a lot of people are happy at 7 p.m. because they're enjoying dinner or movie or whatever, but those people are not on Twitter, right? <laughs> How much of a bias oh, yeah, yeah, do we yeah. have by the fact that Twitter is our data stream here? Yeah, no, that's a weird, it's a weird selection, but I will I will say that more generally if you zoom out, it does match up with Gallup polls. Okay. Right, which which is um, kind of wild, right? And, and we've done some, we've, we have some other instruments. There's one we've called the Lexico Calorimeter, which takes in phrases from Twitter and assigns them as to whether they're 
kind of foodstuffs or about exercise and then assigns calories to them. And so it's at the state level for the US, but the rankings you get out of that, because you sort of get this calories in, calories out, which we're not, you know, we're, we're not sort of, it's a very rough, silly thing, sure. but it matches, it it, it uh, lines up with um, obesity rates. <laughs> so you can tell which states have higher obesity rates from Twitter is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> and you can look at what they, you can look at what they're talking about, right? So, you know, Colorado yeah. does come out number one. Vermont, at least in this time, we looked at was sort of three, I think, and but had a uh, was overly fond of talking about bacon, which didn't, which sort of pushed down. Its, uh, <laughs> I would have thought, you know, Coloradans are, are pretty healthy, outdoorsy people. I don't know. Yeah, so there's lots of skiing and running right. and biking. But a lot yeah, of bacon. those words are there. A lot um, of bacon and donuts. That, yeah. Well, well, that that whole thing is quite amazing to look at because the the ground state, though, if you like, for every what what's being expressed in terms of food and and exercise is pizza and watching television mm. because we have a lot of activities and some of them include like lying down as an activity. <laughs> okay. But what, what, watching television is, is one. So, so the states differ from that, but their baseline is pretty uniform in terms of right. what is being expressed. And of course that's advertising. That's all sorts of things. It's a, it's a bit of a, a melange of, of inputs. And this brings back something that you mentioned right at the beginning. And I thought it was actually I mean, maybe I had not thought this way before, but I really s certainly should have, which is that we very often talk about the uh, traveling of ideas and sharing and contagion of ideas or notions or opinions through social networks and other networks, right? An idea might be, you know, un universal health care or uh, the right to bear arms. But stories can also uh, travel through these information networks and narratives. And is that either something you've done or is it a target to sort of tease out which stories, which narratives are being shared and, and how useful they are? Because I'm certainly willing to believe that a good, compelling narrative uh, wins every day over a, a set of facts, no matter how true they are. Yeah, I have this thing where I say something like, um, "Never, never bring statistics to a story fight." <laughs> right? I mean, it's it's not going to work out for you. So you've got to, you should bring the numbers, but you've got to bring stories as well. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's just just how we kind of operate. And of course, people in politics, people you know, in in religion, understand this. They've been telling, figuring out how to tell stories about things for a long time. And uh, so it's absolutely a, a a long term ambition to do that. It's very hard, but uh, what what you know we have this sort of framing of story wrangle like how do you get out the stories that people are expressing around an event as it happens and then maybe long term so say the parkland shootings uh shooting happened it's a terrible event just to pull one out of the many um how do you sort of track the stories that emanate from that and i by that time in history i was pretty sure that there will be a lot of conspiracy theory type things. Sure. And sure enough, like I remember going on YouTube the next day and just searching mm -hmm. for Parkland and 18 of the top 20 hits, which was sort of presented as 20, were conspiracy theory things about, um, you know, that, that was all faked, it's false flag and, and so on. So how do you measure that in real time? I, I, I mean, this is this is an enormous, enormous goal. That's it's, it's very hard. And then and then, you know, so maybe there's a blossoming of stories after some event because it's just confusion. Which ones are then fighting against each other? Which ones start to to, to win? I have notions of stories, you know, um, kind of having hierarchies to them. You want to be able to tell your story simply. And, and that's where slogans, I think, you know, have this great effect. Um, and they, they might not be tethered to, to some bigger story. Uh, certainly religions work in that way. You want to be able to sort of say things quickly. You know, it's, it's, it's this hierarchy of narratives that you want to be able to deliver. No, I, it's, it's, I, it's, it's an incredibly difficult problem, but I, but I think, um, I think that framing is, is, well, I won't say the right one, but I think it's a very powerful one to be thinking about what are the stories people are telling and how much are they reducing stories to sort of characterization? Hmm. You know, just so, for example, Pizzagate, that story is pretty out there, right? I mean, <laughs> the, the, right, it's pretty out there that there, there's a basement in this comet ping pong place and there are terrible things happening to children and there's a cabal and all this sort of stuff. That's a little hard to grasp, but I think the access in there is really through character. And so Hillary Clinton, for example, being characterized as a as a as this evil person, as, you know, to use folklore kind of things as a witch then you say this story about her and you're like, sure, because mm. she's she's the devil. 
or if you know someone else is sort of framed as a godlike character that can do no wrong and and you say some story about them that you know suggests they've done a bad thing it gets it's deflected it's washed away you know what are the defense mechanisms built into stories is a is a really big part you know how do you how do stories become hermetically sealed or story verses if you like yeah i mean i know that politicians are very focused on the idea that they want to paint their opponents and themselves uh in certain ways like there's certain kinds of criticisms you can make that that just don't stick to certain people because they don't fit the narrative uh, in exactly that way and finding exactly that kind of weak point how do you paint someone as a bad character in a way that is consistent with what people already think about them is the, you know one of the secrets to political success one thing i've seen uh, I've, I've thought about with this danger of power kind of framework is 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 a sort of flipping between saying your opponent is dangerous and weak <laughs> yes and I, and it doesn't seem to matter right i mean we sort of know that in politics you can kind of say lots of things and if it doesn't stick it you know you just keep moving on but they try they're very they're really trying um, you know in our framework orthogonal attacks right they yeah. sort of literally orthogonal attacks so you're trying to say this person is is in a sense quite powerful and dangerous or you know maybe the next day you want to say you know they're, they're feckless and weak and that's a that's a sort of a kind of a funny attack um so really incredibly hard problems and and look there's a there's a huge danger to this as well right i mean being of course being able to manipulate stories and 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 um kind of measure them and do all these sorts of things and see what the weak points are in a system disinformation people work on this all the time i think one of the something i keep reflecting on is you know for scientists and um and journalists my so my wife's a journalist and there's i always sort of think of journalists as scientists with a deadline right? so <laughs> we're, we're we're trying to figure things out and tell the truth about something and kind of explain yeah. things right you know broadly is a big piece um that's a huge battle for us because the 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 possible stories you can come up that are, come up with that are not true, but are favorable to a viewpoint or a culture or whatever, are infinite. Right? There's just an incredible number of things to maybe you know what's adjacent to a, to the true story. You can you can really explore some stuff and find the stories that will spread faster, that will you know tack on to people's existing beliefs. So that you know that just is. A, going to be a challenge it's always been a challenge it's just uh, in sort of a time of so much information right so much availability so much ability to curate and kind of create story verses that are misleading um online that you can be taken into it's 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 you know, we 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 have to work really hard on this. This is hard. So I, w I went to the web page for the he denominator. Uh, I encourage everyone to check it out, and it's searchable, right? You can look for all sorts of wonderful things. And so just to normalize my own expectations, I searched for the frequency of the word quantum because this is something I'm interested in, and it doesn't have a lot of you know uh, high rates of appearance in news stories, but occasionally and. What you find is probably what I should have expected ahead of time, which is that there's a sort of baseline, which is pretty normal, and then there are spikes, and the spikes are pretty extremely noticeable. But I don't know what the spikes are from, right? I mean, clearly there was some story about a quantum computer or something like that. Uh, maybe my book came out. I don't know, but uh, that would be great. Um, <laughs> but so how much of that sort of... Uh, back engineering, reverse engineering, can you do when you see something weird happening in the data? Uh, oftentimes in the big stories, you just know what it is, but is, is are there objective procedures for figuring out why the words are shifting in these different ways on different days? Yeah, so a number of pieces here. This has been a, an eternally interesting, difficult problem. Um, what happened? Yeah. Like what happened, right? And, and I remember early on, you know, maybe 15 even 20 years ago, looking through Google, trying to find out what happened on a particular day. Right. It was kind of hard. Like, and, and then Wikipedia emerges. And if you would, of course, has, has entries for every date of history, sort of, I suppose now, but, um, but certainly in the modern times. And they're sort of weird lists. It's just a weird <laughs> list of things that happened in the world. You know, there was a Star Trek convention. There was, you know, this war started. I mean, it's a real mixture. It was a concert. So, with with some of what we've got there, story wrangling, for example, if you click on a on a point, it will it will take you to Twitter and search Twitter for that date, and you will it will sort of show you which tweets are being amplified on that oh, okay. date potentially. So tweets get deleted, 
it's a bit of a problem, so maybe it doesn't hold up. But that's something where we, and it, you know, it depends on the sort of restrictions you have. We have ten percent of all tweets going back to two thousand and eight, but we can't, you know, sort of share them and, and put them out wholesale. So we've tried to do something there by pushing it back into the, you know, the actual structure itself of Twitter. Google Books, for example, you can't really, it's harder to do that, right? So it's harder to go back and, and search for like Google Trends. You kind of want to figure out like, why is this thing being talked about? So at least I think with Twitter, we, we have that to some extent. We have another big body of work, which really is connected to this, trying to figure out exactly this, what happened on a particular day or in a particular week. And, and we did it around Trump. Um, just, I mean, it's the president, it matters. Um, it's a very good test case. Uh, and, and I think it, it certainly 2015, 2020, and, and kind of, you know, still now, really what I call a turbulent time, story, story turbulence has been really high, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, the turnover of stories has just been kind of incredible. And I remember sort of thinking in 2016, 17, like, especially 2017, I think, can you remember what happened in the last two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> can you say you know and so it was a challenge yeah. right there, there could be massive events like space force or something or <laughs> you know the, the, you could just there's always something sort of yeah there's always something and I, you know look the world's a, a rich place but it was a an effort to sort of study that so we have this uh thing which is kind of computational timeline reconstruction and it works through twitter but it could work through anything so we could do it through say a state has archives for example going back in time or or any kind of news source, you know, maybe the New York Times. Um, what what are the sort of narratively dominant terms, like words and pairs of words that kind of pop up? And these kind of act, act then like keywords into bigger stories. So they're not telling you, say, you know, buying Greenland. It doesn't tell you like the whole story of Greenland, but it would, um, and again, this is referencing Trump, but it would it sort of point it out. Um, but, you know, early on, uh, what we were able to see there early on was uh, that there's there was a lot of turbulence in that first year, 2017. There was just a lot of changeover. Um, uh, there, were, there were also just natural disasters, so Hurricane Maria yeah. and so on. So these things came on. But there was North Korea, you know, sort of provocations, and then Charlottesville happened the next week. And it's it's hard to remember the orderings of these things. So so it 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 we have a timeline that. You know that that kind of comes out computationally, and what you see in 2020 is just this really just sudden change into coronavirus, as we called COVID coronavirus initially for for many months, just being the dominant story every day for months. Yeah. And we have a measure we call it chronopathy. You can see that time functionally slowed down because there was just not so much turnover in stories. It was always the same dominant story. George Floyd's murder explodes the narrative. And uh, and then, but that becomes stuck again too because that becomes a durable story. So, and then of course we get to the election and things. So you can quantify again. the impression we all have that sort of time froze once the pandemic hit. Right, and people said this. They said, you know, you, people say this anecdotally all the time. You know, yesterday felt like a week. Yeah, I'm gonna. I saw one tweet was like, I'm gonna write a autobiography of my last <laughs> the last ten years of my life. It's called 2020. You know, like, <laughs> but, you know, so. I don't mean it's a very physics-ish sort of thing, yeah. like time dilation and so on. But this was a memory, you know, at the population scale. Of, did things seem to really, you know, maybe it wouldn't have. Maybe, you know, there is this just sort of turnover. It doesn't really matter. But in fact, yeah, 14 days in April 2020 is kind of, you would have the same sort of turnover in two days in 2017. And, so it really and it's, a weird, slow. it's a weird thing. I know I had David Eagleman on the podcast a while ago, but like there's this weird mismatch between simultaneously one says nothing is happening and time seems to last forever right even though <laughs> so the the, right. the the rate at which time passes is sort of inverse to the rapid rapidity with which things happen an exciting movie seems to go by very quickly yeah yeah no that can be and it depends how much you're recording you know in your own mind yeah, right much, I mean, there are right. studies of how people yeah so when when something and it's usually around something sort of dire or terrible happening you know an accident you you have this seeming slow motion replay of it in your head. And it's because you were really kind of writing down the memory. I mean, that, that's what I understand, right? You were really recording it yeah. and kind of you have it in fine detail. But that, there's a lot that goes on in life, right? And we, we know we miss most of it. 
the sounds and the things. And, you know, they just sort of pour past us. There's a, too much to measure for one person. So our brains are pretty, well, problematically good, perhaps, at, at, at just ignoring things that don't fit our little narrative right now. I mean, there's certainly a lot that, you know, that we've covered that is going on here. I do. It's wonderful to have this conversation because I get the impression that a lot of the excitement in what you're doing is still ahead. Like we're, we've just started picking some of the low-hanging fruit. But I guess one final question, which you did allude to earlier, but we can take these ideas and turn them around and put them to work, right? I mean, maybe either in artificial intelligence or in political campaigns or in writing a screenplay, you know, like, can we figure out, can we distill what would be the perfect narrative or the perfect time structure of valence or something like that? Uh, are, are people trying to operationalize these ideas in that sense? Yeah. So there's a lot of work over the years and, and you can maybe make a fair amount of money of saying you can predict which things will take off, right? Because of your analytic tool. Right. So it's, you know, it's, I think, I think what we can do is say, look, here's the shape of your story. You know, here are the kind of tropes you've used and so on. And, and this is how it compares to others around. And, you know, maybe give people a sort of a diagnostic like that. Now, in terms of making something take off for sure, well, so the, this is the problem, right? Reality is socially constructed. And we have older work on, yeah, we have older work on on fame. And, and of course, many people have kind of come to this in different ways that, that show if you have kind of basically you run the world over and over for cultural, social things, it, it doesn't always, it, it, there's a lot of variability, yeah. right? Harry Potter doesn't win in every, every universe. It certainly didn't win for the first 12 or 13 editors who said no, right? Like, how could they not know? How could they not know, yeah. right? They're, 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 they're professionals, right? But how could they not know that this would be this giant thing? And that actually indicates how uh, much fortune and luck, the, the fact that there's an enormous runaway success in, in something, right? The world is full of these, right? Where the, the number one thing is so much bigger than the second one and the third one, right? These heavy tail distributions that it's indicative of actually, we, what we'll tell is, you know, what our, our simple story for that is the Mona Lisa is fantastic, for example. Like it is intrinsically amazing. You know, if you look at it, you will be transported and it's because of this and this and this. But we just leave out completely the social construction yeah. aspect. It's because you know, it took 400 years to get to that idea that it's, it was the greatest painting in the world. Um, and there's, there's a whole sort of set of reasons for why it became increasingly famous that are not intrinsic, you know, the stories around it. But it's a good example of something where, you know, you can't really kind of, I mean, I guess that's the point of view. Like you, you can't go, you try to make things as good as you can and, and you want them, you want to make them spreadable. That's important that people want to tell other people about it. I think that's the great thing. And of course that works for disinformation as well, mm -hmm. right? So so what it, what will spread in the social wild, right? This is the, the great problem of advertising, right? This is sort of probably made up line, but you know, half the money is wasted in advertising. We just don't know which half, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, and it, you know, it's sort of true. Like, the, yeah. like very unexpected things happen and take off. And, and, and how did you not know that before? Well, there's, there's a lot of social construction that goes on. But so it wouldn't be anything that would, you know, guarantee the future of, you know, ha of, of some social phenomenon. But it would serve as a, I think, can serve as a diagnostic I. I worry about the negative aspects, you know, I mean, mm. you know, um, but I think we have like all of science here, we have to know that we have to, we have to know the things, right. So that we can start to build defense systems. And I think AI, for example, or what we'll call AI or sort of certainly the modern work with, um, with language and, and all of these kind of, <laughs> kind of crazy instruments, you know, they've gotten a little, they've gotten way ahead of us, right. We're, we're trying to make, decisions about, you know, injuries or parole or something like that, or presenting things that turn out to be deeply racist or whatever. And, you know, and, and, and you know, we've got this, we, we've got ourselves um, way beyond describe and explain in, into the sort of create category of, of science. And, um, you know, we need, we, I think, I mean, I think it's turning around. People are looking at the corpora and so on mm -hmm. that they've built some of these systems out of. And, uh, you know, I'm really, relieved to see that happen because I think there was a wild time there and, and we got ourselves, uh, you know, like Facebook's algorithm, right? What, which things spread, right? You have dials that you turn to make certain things spread or not spread 
you can change the social contagion there. And that's, you know, it's, it's, yes, there's money on one side, but there's also just, you know, just society hold together on, on, on another side. And, and, and I think that's, I guess, I think that's important. I guess there's also a feedback question, right? I mean, there's this David Lodge novel I read from the eighties and, and he mentions very, very early efforts in, uh, digital humanities where you would, you know, digitize someone's book and figure out what words they used more often than than the typical English language. And this author was was shown, you know, that you use the word, you know, moist or whatever, way more than average. And <laughs> once he found out those words, he couldn't write anymore, like because he was too self-conscious about doing it. And I wonder if we figure out too much about, you know, how, what the, the shapes of these stories are and everything, how that's going to affect how we tell them ourselves. Yeah, there's some peril there, I suppose. Um, yeah, scientists, classic science move, just look too deep. It's like trying to understand comedy and destroy yeah. everything, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Explaining the joke. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, scientists. Uh, no, I think I, I would hope it would just get, I mean, people are incredibly creative. You know, people are incredibly creative. We find new ways to tell stories. We're, we're in a time where we have so many stories in the past that we kind of play with them and, and so on. It's, it's you know, it's a, I think it's, I I I don't I don't think it will will stop all of that. Um, it could produce it can produce some stuff that's not very good. I think that's that maybe yeah. is the problem. Well, you try to build formulas too much and so on. So that 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 could be a slightly a more dangerous. Fair problem. enough. Well, all right. I will just repeat. Thanks, scientists. I like that as a motto. Uh, and Peter Dodds, thanks very much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Sean, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>